Welcome back, everybody, to the Vulcan Deckmasters Playoffs, the number two. It's time for Surrender versus Strife Crow. Surrender, hailing from Team Godzio uh, over in South Korea. Strife Crow representing Cloud9, the very famous Western esports organization. And coming off after beating Toyota Kibler and uh, being able to win his first match against Orange. So, I mean, having lost to Strife Crow is nothing to be ashamed of, Kibler, but... I guess the, the, you, everyone's kind of had their path to victory through you today. Is that what's going on? Wow, is that what you're saying? Jeez, everyone, everyone's just beating up. It's, it's the rite of passage, you know? It's like <laughs> you're, the, you're the first quest in the journey to be the Vulcan champion. I, okay, I'd rather be like the last quest than the first quest. Gotcha. The last quest is a tough one. Usually the first one's pretty easy, and I don't like to think of myself that way. <laughs> <laughs> you are literally like Laura Walker show in the tutorial. That's what it is. Jeez, yeah, like, like I think I think that's more Strife Crow. That's like, even his Archon image is him as Lurewalker show. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I guess you can be Millhouse Man of Storm then, yeah, if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, we're, we're having fun here, guys. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying it too. Make sure to check out uh, all the cool stuff that uh, Vulcan's also doing with Squarespace. Uh, Squarespace.com/slash/deckmasters uh, allows you to make professionally design websites. You don't really have to be good at anything. Uh, I'm actually contemplating making one because I realize I don't have a website about myself and a lot of people keep asking about it. Um, so I think I'm, I'm going to do one. Uh, Kibler probably uses his own thing of how he structures his own website, but it's cool. You know, you guys, especially those who want to start getting more to content creation, people always ask me, like, how do I get into casting? How do I get into content creation? Uh, I think having your own portfolio and a website to showcase yourself really helps. So make sure you can check it out once again, squarespace.com. Yeah, I mean, I actually get a lot of people ask me about getting into game design as well. And I point out that I think that one of the best ways to get noticed by game companies is to share your thoughts on games. And one of the best ways to do that is having a blog, a website where you yep. actually uh, are able to communicate with the community. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, uh, you know, one person is also studying game design at Strife Crow. He's went to school for it, but he put that on hold because Hearthstone's going very well and he decided to dedicate some of his, his time to it. Uh, happy he was able to go full time into it because for a while he was a part time player and now he's definitely been going full steam ahead up against Surrender, who seems to be on the Warrior deck and looks like he is playing that patron warrior because I think we saw the battle rage just now being pushed away. Yeah, so we have we, uh, we have Strife Crow with Warrior, Warlock, and Hunter, which we saw earlier in his match against Orange, while Surrender has Hunter, Warrior, and Rogue. So Rogue is not a class that we've seen today at least. Uh, what do you think these just general matchups are likely to look like? Well, I really like Handlock against the Patron Warrior because you just put big threats out. They can't really answer it outside of the executes and you pressure them out of the game. In fact, I would say that Handlocked is one of maybe three decks that has a favorable matchup against Patron, which makes it such a good deck, right? Part of the reason why a deck is good in Conquest is lack of poor matchups. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's why I think Handlock's an excellent choice if you anticipate your opponent starting off with a deck because Patron feels like a good leadoff since it has the highest chance probability-wise to get an early win based off of a lack of bad matchups. Yeah. Patron is a deck that, that most tournament lineups seem to contain these days, so having, a, having your decks generally line up well against Patron is usually a good call. And uh, this Handlock deck from Strife Crow uh, certainly does that. I, uh, I think that Strife Crow right now, sort of what d deciding whether he wants to maybe life tap this turn, maybe Mortal Coil that uh, that Loot Hoarder. Loot Hoarder is actually one of the kind of flex slots we've seen in Patron decks these days. Mm -hmm. uh, Patron decks like to use lots of cards that allow them to cycle through and find their key cards in their deck. Loot Hoarder being one of those because it does have the, the death rattle of drawing a card. Uh, but we have seen that replaced in some cases by by Slam, in some cases by Shield Block. Usually you see some sort of mix of those, and uh, here, clearly, Surrender has chosen to go with the Loot Hoarder. Yeah, the Loot Hoarder often gets replaced by more board impact stuff. Um, like, Unstable Ghouls started coming into the two slot, and then you start putting in Slam, and then it's like, well, where do I fit in with that if I have a Fiery War Axe and Battle Rage and Cruel Taskmasters? And even those sometimes are getting cut, too. Like, maybe fire, one Fiery War Axe is being run in the deck. Maybe one or no Cruel Taskmasters. It's, it's very interesting to see that, because, you know, now that you don't run Gromash, do you really need Cruel Taskmasters? So there's a lot of variation between, you know, sometimes two to six cards between patient lists. Yeah, there's there's certainly a core that you see in these patron decks uh, of you know obviously the, all the combo pieces, the various card draw effects, death's bite, 
uh, emperor. But outside of that, you know, there are definitely uh, a number of, of things people do uh, a bit differently. This is actually kind of interesting from Strife Crow. I'm curious what his reasoning was um, for specifically playing that Ancient Watcher there when he does have Mortal Coil in his hand. Uh, and there's not that many uh, targets for Mortal Coil directly in the Patron deck. And now Strife Crow picks up a second Mortal Coil, and it's possible that he actually ends up uh, in a difficult spot finding places to use these. Yeah. Um, although one thing it can be used for is those patrons end up getting a bunch of whirlwind combinations. They end up getting picked off. But I think you're generally correct. Um, not to mention that you want to dig deeper into your deck, you know, always to get close to those threats. He doesn't have a turn four play right now. He's well, his turn four play is to coin Lothab if he wants to play a threat. Even then, it's not as appealing as just dropping Twilight Drake or a Mountain Giant that he draws. Right. I, I feel like I feel like if I were in Strife Crow's spot, you know, I'd be looking for more more proactive things to be doing mm -hmm. here. Finding a play, you know, finding an opportunity to use that mortal co coil, and also the fact that uh, he gave his opponent a, a the ancient watcher to attack into with a, with a potential weapon, uh, also runs the risk of enabling his opponent's battle rages earlier. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, I do know one thing though. I think if since he's he's going second, mm -hmm. he has to be able to throw a card out before he gets to inevitable four play because he can't just keep life tapping. Um, Otherwise, he'd just be discarding a card. So I well, think he felt like... Would have, been, would have been Mortal Coil rather than rather than the guy. So it wouldn't have been life tapping. Gotcha, there. gotcha. gotcha. I, I think uh, that's maybe something that was going through his mind as well. You know? Sure. And we do see Coin Lothab just to get on the board. <laughs> right now, Strife Crow's hand has nothing that can actually come down. And then, nope. Oh, death Spite. Just... Second Death Spite pickup for Surrender. Uh, I have to wonder if he's going to just clear this uh this lothab right now yes i imagine that's probably what he'll do it sets up a death spite next turn with uh potential acolyte to draw extra cards and he already has the battle rage so i mean he, he next turn could easily potentially play double minion or uh the, rather the the acolyte into battle rage and uh you know, draw a whole bunch of cards yeah, it's particularly strong too cuz it can answer anything that comes out on turn 5 from your opponent if it's a sludge belcher if it's something that can get five health or less, he can answer it while drawing cards too. So that's it's a really good way to supplement his damage. And this I is like, yeah, yeah, this, this is like from really surrender here for sure. He's uh, setting up to just kill the the Lothab with the death rattle of his death spite rather than attacking his minion into it. He gets two damage in. If his opponent does choose to trade with a minion, he's still gotten the damage. So, uh, but if his opponent tries to uh, tries to preserve his Lothab, that death rattle will still kill it. It's interesting. He is basically trading two damage for potentially five, um, but putting himself in a position where he's making better use of his resources, potentially. Yeah, I can't foresee it really backfiring outside of his opponent being able to remove it and buff that health. Like if he was playing Farseer or something weird, but I think people have really rotated that card out in terms of the handlock, so I think that's a pretty nice play to squeeze in damage. Um, considering that he already has a Frothing Berserker and a Warsong Commander, so he's definitely, you can bet that he's counting damage at this point already, like, well, what's the most I can optimize with Frothing Berserker and a Whirlwind? Well, if I have, you know, the Death by Hitting Face and the Inner Rage with the Frothing Berserker, that's what already at least, like, upwards of 10 plus damage I can do if more minions fill up on the board even more. Yeah, I mean, and here we're gonna we're gonna likely see, as we we're discussing last turn, the uh, the acolyte into attack your guy into battle range, which is a lot of cards. We're drawing uh, drawing three additional cards this turn. We do see a cruel mm. taskmaster pickup from surrender there. So, yeah, uh, he is not among those who have cut that card from his deck. Yeah, I don't mind playing cruel taskmaster here. Although battle range does get you two cards immediately. Just generally speaking, I think uh, if you have cruel taskmaster, that probably means you have gromosh. So I would d definitely want to dig deeper because that might be an alter uh, alternative win condition if you can't get the frothings out. I mean, the Taskmaster potentially does open him up to a Mortal Coil, which Surrender hasn't seen come out just yet. So sure. I can imagine he uh, he may want to avoid that. He has a lot of potential value point. from those cards later as well. And I mean, Strife Crow's hand here is just terrible. You know he can he can life tap into a Twilight Drake, but the, most of his hand isn't really doing much of anything. Yeah, two Shadow Flames here, not really doing much. Chooses to play uh, the Twilight double Drake mortal. with double Mortal Coil. 
he overdrawing his opponent? Uh, it looks like he might be. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a very cute play for sure. Ooh, okay. who's a patron? <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Not really sure if the uh, the patron ends up being that relevant in this matchup specifically, but you know every little bit helps. Here's one card that is big, the Unstable Ghoul, and I think if Surrender can start setting up to potentially pick up Emperor Thorson or even set up for um, eight mana on Frothing Berserker, Warsong Commander, and Unstable Ghoul, like those kinds of combinations are so huge for damage. And uh, I, I really like being able to go for a kill next turn. I mean, if he if he attacks with the Death Spite now, puts his opponent to 20, and leaves him with the ability to possibly cast Warsong Frothing Unstable next turn, um, or Warthong, Warsong Frosting, Frothing, I mean, uh, Whirlwind, Inner Rage, Inner Rage, <laughs> all sorts of things. <laughs> it's a lot of damage, it's a lot of damage. It is, um, it is a whole lot of damage. I mean, the Unstable Ghoul will be worth about 6 or 7 damage uh, if a minion gets played, and then the, the Inner Rage would be the same thing. Um, around 6 damage for 2 Inner Rages. So that should be enough to kill if his opponent plays, like, Dr. Boom, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, well, there's always, with Dr. Boom, there's always the danger of the Whirlwind effects actually just killing your, uh, oh, your right. thing or worse on Commander. It's never, it's never safe. You know, even if uh, ooh, a patron is a nice pickup here. Though it might be, I mean, the yeah. frothing, the frothing kill is is actually at very real here. Mm -hmm. if he goes if he goes plays the commander frothing unstable ghoul goes face the uh, the frothing. I guess he was he'll want to go face with the the uh, cruel first, just in case of the the bombs going off. And he's going with the patron instead. Okay. <clears throat> This still might be lethal, right? If he's able to get with as one. Many inner as he has. Yeah. That's 5, 10, 16. Yeah, 13, 14, 15. Oh, it's actually just. Yeah, it's almost yeah. certainly lethal. As long. Especially well, if one of them doesn't die, but. Yeah, it is, it is substantially safer, too. Mm hmm. Because he'd have so. to. Basically, unless Warsong Commander dies here, he wins the game. Not even, because the Warsong gives the charge no, immediately right, before it's charge charge immediately. Yeah, you're, you're totally yeah, right. Yeah. So it has to kill a, both patrons. For both for of the new east on. Oh! Oh! Oh, man. That would have been so funny. Because <laughs> yeah, then maybe. his opponent plays double Molten and like, gets a Taunter, and then that's the end of the game. Yeah, that was... So, yeah, the uh, the patron deck manages to squeeze out the win against uh, against Handlock. Traditionally, a matchup where the patron deck can certainly struggle. Um, so Surrender has to be pretty happy about that one. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Surrender being able to take a matchup that's unfavored is huge. Uh, now that he has Rogue, I mean, he wants to give more chances for that Rogue to survive, and I'm not sure how much I like it. You know, Rogue against... Um, that kind of uh, warlock deck, or you know, the hunter. Th those things are really hard matchups to win. So I think, generally speaking, surrender was really happy to see that outcome. Um, not just for because you get an early lead, but because those matchups would only get more tough if uh, he ended up dropping that game. I, I am slightly surprised to see Rogue in Surrender's lineup. Uh, it is a class that I've actually seen struggle quite a bit in tournaments recently. Uh, I believe Rogue is one of the least successful classes currently in the Archon Team League. Uh, you know, it, it has been it has been the uh, the sort of weak link of many lineups so far. And uh, but now we see Surrender, Surrender going with his Hunter deck, and we see a Worgen Infiltrator in his hand. So uh, it does seem like it is a Face Hunter style of deck, and he cannot be happy to be facing off against Control Warrior. No, Control Warrior um, allows him to be really defensive and strong. You have so many ways to gain life through the, you know, the armor smiths, the shield mains, the shield blocks, the Alex Straza. So that's that's gonna be problematic. But <clears throat> if you curve out really well and your opponent has no answer to it, Face Hunter can do a lot of damage racked up very quickly. Oh, for sure. I mean, the uh, especially if the Warrior deck doesn't manage to get. Uh, especially some of its non-damage, non-weapon-based removal in the early game. We do see Strifecrow with a Cruel Taskmaster in his hand, which is actually one of the best cards in the matchup because it can remove uh, one of the 
uh, face hunter decks one drops without actually costing you life. Uh, but if you're if you're able to get a lot of the early minions that can uh, generate repeatable damage uh, in the early game, it, it can be tough for the warrior to actually come back because they don't necessarily have the window to use their hero power to armor up. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times you try to cancel out the hero power, but it just stacks too much damage. Not in this case, though. And Surrender, if he goes for a double, a double one drop play with uh, the Leper Gnome, it will get destroyed by the cool Taskmaster and then uh, forces the opponent to be in a really awkward spot. He'll have to use the Glaive Zuko instead of the Mad Scientist then to add damage. Yeah, this cool Taskmaster is going to come up really big for Strife Crow. Uh, I imagine we'll see it come down here. Yeah, so this Cruel Taskmaster taking out the Leper Gnome is, is quite good for him. Uh, and then, yeah, we're, we're going to see Eagle Zuka, I imagine, come down and surrender side, take out the the Cruel Taskmaster to make way for that Worgen Infiltrator. And that puts Strife Crow in a position where he can... He has a couple of actual options in his turn. Um, he can either use Fiery War Axe to attack it directly, or he could actually just armor up and shield slam, which I think is also a reasonable option. It's turning into drain life. It's well, pretty much I mean, what Shield Slam becomes. Yeah, well, Shield sl your your life total is so valuable in, in the matchup against Face Hunter that getting the opportunity to use armor up is uh, is pretty nice. And because your your health is being pressured so dramatically, uh, you're very rarely going to have the opportunity to use Shield Slam to be that effective against uh, large minions until you actually get to the point in the game where you're playing Shield Maidens and. Once you're at the point in the game that you're playing Shield Maidens, you're generally pretty happy anyway. True, true that. And the game only becomes easier from that point on because your bombs are much stronger than theirs, mm -hmm. uh, assuming you can continue to push it out. He is also introduced... I, gotta move. I think we lost Frodan here for a little bit, but uh, looks like Strife Crow is, is in fact with the armor up Shield Slam play taking out the Worgen Infiltrator, putting himself up to 27 effective health. Uh, it also leaves open the play to possibly Iron Beak Owl plus Fire War Axe next turn, um, which, you know, if your opponent does play something like a Mad Scientist, might be a reasonable option. Uh, I expect we'll see the uh, Animal Companion here from Surrender. He is... Uh, there's no real bad result. I actually think the best result from him is likely Misha, just because we know that Strife Crow does not have a... Uh, a death spite in his hand, but, but he does get a Leoc, which is okay, but uh, because it doesn't die to Fiery War Axe. And Ysera, not the card that Strife Crow is looking for in this matchup. Uh, he is probably going to win when he gets to that point in the game anyway, so the, the, the card advantage isn't really the tool that he's looking for. So, But because the, the, the minion that uh, Surrender Play does have four health. That War Axe can't take care of it. And it does put Strife Crow in kind of an awkward spot in terms of the use of his resources. So here Surrender goes with... Looks like Mad Scientist. And maybe... I, I would not be surprised to see a quick shot on this, uh, this Acolyte to, pre to prevent it from potentially helping uh, the War Axe contest the Leoc, uh, as well as keeping Strife Crow from potentially drawing multiple cards with it. So, looks like Surrender kind of kind of giving a, giving us some thought exactly what he wants to do with his turn. You can see him put his head in his hands, like, okay, what to do? I'm back, Gibbler. Sorry about yeah. that. Welcome back. Yep. Oh, okay, you did go for the accolade play. I was asking you about that right before, uh, you know, I decided to get kicked out. Well, now <laughs> we know, and knowing is half of that. <laughs> go, Joe! The other half is... 25% of it is red lasers, and 25% is blue lasers, as far as I can tell. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. Or if you can replace that with wires if you're trying to defuse a bomb. I don't think there are many bombs in G.I. Joe, though. Mm. Ooh, well, shield block is a pretty good that's, pickup. That's yeah. just generally a good card in uh, in this matchup. And uh, Strife Crow is going to get two draws off of his Acolyte, uh, and, and is able to use the Fiery War Axe to eliminate the Leoc. Which I, I though he did destroy Death Spite, which potentially may change what he wants to do with his turn. Um, the problem with playing Death Spite here is that it's both uh, mana and resource inefficient. He can't either play Shield Block or Armor Up if he does play Death Spite here. 
Playing War Axe allows him to clear the Leoc and also either armor up or shield block, depending on whether he feels like uh, short-term or long-term armor gain is more valuable. Yeah. Is there any chance that he would play the Owl, or has he saved that for something else? So I can imagine possibly Owling the Mad Scientist, but... Right now he doesn't, uh, uh, he has a possible, if he does play War Axe here, he has the possible Death Spite and Owl next turn. It looks like he's going with, with Death Spite here, though. It's interesting. Yeah. I think the thought is that he needs to set up that Whirlwind effect, so that way he can take out whatever chargers that come out next turn, if it's a Wolf Rider. Um, well, also, playing the Fiery War Axe gives him a problematic way to deal with that. Yeah, it, it also allows him to, if it's a, to potentially take out his opponent's Mad Scientist uh, with his... Acolyte plus the death rattle effect of the death spite. Yeah, it's actually a really good point, too. I like that. In this case, it ends up paying off. Misses, and he's going to attack here. And yeah, now the death spite actually can be extremely effective. Um, I, I actually would be surprised. Yeah, I'd be surprised to see Glaive Zuka not take out the Acolyte at this point. Uh, it will allow Surrender to preserve one of his two health minions on the board. And he does exactly that. And this is giving Strike Pro a lot of resources, though. I mean, he can... He can now... Ooh, and Alex Yikes. draws a big pickup here. That's um, huge. If, if Strife Crow is able to survive to the late turns of the game, that Alex Straza can actually just put things completely out of reach for Surrender. Hmm. Still needs to stabilize, though, on board. He still is at half HP, and there's a Lepernome on board. Uh, I have to imagine that he's also thinking about ways to play Dr. Boom as safe as possible next turn. Mm -hmm. Because that allows him to start pushing damage or even control the state of the board. Uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, here I expect, yeah, we're going to see the Owl silence, the, the Mad Scientist, an Axe, and then Armor Up. So this gives so this gets... Oh, go ahead. No, I think I, I was just wondering because because you have to also think about uh, when you can play cards like Shield Block too. Um, so mm -hmm. armoring up is really good, but you have to always be careful. Like, can I squeeze in Shield Block or does it disrupt my plays too much on the following turns? Um, and that's where you have to evaluate it too. And, you know, being able to equip that Firework Axe is nice, but sometimes you have to be concerned about dying. Yeah, and this explosive trap in Surrender's hand is looking really bad. Not only is it just a you know, a reactive card in this matchup where he really wants to be as proactive as possible. Uh, it, it is also kind of clogging up his hand when he'd love to be able to easily play something to enable the free draw of quick shot. And Strife Crow going to just try and keep himself alive. I like I like this play compared to Doctor Boom this turn. It allows him to gain seven effective health and uh, bridge the turn to next now that he drew the Shield Maiden. Uh, be able to potentially shield maiden plus armor up next turn into turn nine Alex Straza. Oh, that'd be excellent if that goes according to plan. Of course, yeah. quick shot on the other end might be able to draw into more damage. What's the dream here? Is a quick shot into? Uh, I don't think I actually don't think version? you want a quick shot this turn. I think you actually want to play your your juggler and hero power because next turn you can play anything you draw and also quick shot. Good point. So, good point. You, 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 if you quick shot this turn, you get a card draw, but you waste a hero power, which is worth as much as a card. Mm hmm. Yep, really good point. So, I expect to see uh, Strife Crow axe down on the knife juggler here and then just shield maiden click your button. And he is really putting himself uh, out of range of most anything that can kill him this turn. We could see, like, you know, quick shot into quick shot into who knows. <laughs> Oh, oh my he god. Took the second quick shot, so you can't actually that, chain them. Use the quick shot. That, that's, can't that's, chain that one. <laughs> that's the one fringe scenario where uh, the previous play where we were talking about like quick shotting at that turn was uh was probably very the more. marginally better, but now yeah. now this is a disaster for surrender because Alex Straza comes down, gains twelve life. Yes. And then Armsmith just came into hand, so explosive trap becomes really weak because it gains more life than it kills. And he still got shield block. Yeah, I think Strife right now is, is wondering, okay, is there perhaps a, sp a snake trap? You know, like cause if I if I attack that uh, that mad scientist and it's snake trap, this could be really bad. 
Um, but no, Alex Strazer just comes down, and boom. Uh, I'm, I'm watching Surrender's reaction here. Ooh, Stoneface. Stoneface the Alex Straza. Yeah, I mean, it, this was a tough matchup to start with. Um, <laughs> oh, know, no, he, he looks so to the ways. sky. Why me? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think Why won, you? Because you play Phase Hunter, man. That's kind of what happens. The product this is called Karmic Justice. You know, right. and when, when you, you when you play Face Hunter, you deserve to every now and then get Shell Block into Shield Maiden into Alex Straza because, you know, otherwise, you know, faces everywhere just would just melt left and right, and there'd be nothing anyone could do. Yep, not out of the woods just yet, but it's looking better by the turn here for Strife Crow. Shield Block gives him a considerable amount of health. Armor Smith allows him to gain even more. Oh, Armor Smith Sh and Sludge Belcher. Yeah, this is this is this is just monstrous for Strife Crow. And yeah, Surrender's just had he's had enough. He uh, he concedes putting uh, the match to one game to one with uh, right. both warrior decks taking down their first games. All right, so uh, Warrior is removed, so it means Warlock and Hunter up against uh, Rogue and Hunter coming up here on stream. And uh, the Hunter we know from Surrender is the face one, which means if Strife Crow feels more confident in his Warlock, he might end up going for it. But I have to imagine that this Hunter is pretty good against either option because um, Strife Crow has a slower Hunter, right? So the face Hunter should still be able to pressure both these decks very effectively. Yeah, I actually think that Strife Crow's Warlock is better against his opponent's Hunter than his Hunter is. Uh, a lot of people think that Handlock is uh, is a bad matchup, has a bad matchup against Face Hunter because it you know uses its life total for a resource. But Face Hunter has so has so many just cards that are only able to do so much damage because they're a bunch of small minions and the, the individual burst damage effects uh, that it really just kind of has to go for it. Unlike some decks where they can kind of leave the, the Warlock deck at, say, 16, 17 life, you, you aren't able to just sort of do big burst uh, hits with something like a Savannah High main with face hunter decks. So you frequently are just at the mercy of your opponent's draws, and if, they, if they're able to find heal bots and Molten Giants, you're just going to lose. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Well, we do see that he ends up going for that Handlock deck. And instead of going for the Hunter, Surrender puts that on the table and tries to sneak in with Rogue. And I feel like there was a level of mind games there that maybe Surrender wanted to catch the mid-range Hunter, if that's what he's anticipating. Or actually, I don't know, maybe he feels comfortable in this matchup too. I know a lot of Rogue specialists, uh, in fact, think Rogue is favored in this matchup. Uh, the the addition of Tinker Sharp Sword Oil, uh, which makes the the possibility of just having enormous board clearing blade flurries, uh, I think really switched this matchup around from its pre uh, GVG counterpart. I know that that previously uh, Rogue decks often really struggled with handlock because of you know the big minions and taunts, uh, so they weren't able to really get damage through. But now the board, because handlock in many cases is so fixated on building up a big board. Uh, the board clear p potential of huge blade flurries can really put them in a tough spot. Yeah, um, and the fact <clears throat> that Warlocks are starting to rotate some weapon removals does help improve the matchup a little bit. For example, we saw Toyota with an ooze in his handlock deck. Um, not sure if Strike was running that, but I like to see those small inclusions that help him innovate it, because Handlock's one of the most unchanging decks uh, prior to even Blackrock Mountain coming out. Mm -hmm. Or GVG, uh, but unless, it's now starting to see some innovation with small tech like that. Unless your life coach who just plays a different version of Handlock every single week in all the leagues he plays, it's really amusing. <laughs> sort of the development of you know his he's got this Handlock deck with you know no giants, this Handlock deck with demons, this Handlock deck with or without Ragnaros, and it's it's actually I, I think really cool to see how those little things can potentially give you edges as your opponent expects something, and then if it's different, uh, can really throw them off. Absolutely. Now we have one of the strongest plays against uh, Rogue, being able to go for turn three Drake into turn four Drake, because um, they can't deal with such high health minions that easily here. Yeah, Rogue. Rogue definitely because it uses damage based removal, and because a lot of its removal is is weapon based and based on attacking into opposing minions, uh, really can struggle with big uh, high health minions yeah, like great. Twilight Drake early on. Yeah, there, there always was argument about how Twilight Drakes could be used in tandem with Mountain Giants, but when you have two Twilight Drakes, coining out one and the other is just so strong. Nothing you can really do about that. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah, this, I mean, Strifecore's hand this game is fantastic. He's able to put so much pressure on with Drake into Drake, clear his opponent's, uh, one of his opponent's minions, and he's still, I mean, his Drakes are huge. They're both 4-8. Uh, there is a sap, which is not quite on time. If he'd had the sap last turn, he would be in a lot better spot. Um, he also just used his SI agent just uh, naked on the board last turn, which means that he can't sap into SI to kill the 4-5 either. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, well, we could see sap into eviscerate attack, and then just attack his opponent's face. I still think I like playing the the Drake here. Um, mm -hmm. to try to dig for deeper answers because yeah, I think I you have see. to be a little bit more aggressive on the front mm -hmm. instead of defensive. Ooh. Like, hmm. we could see Lotheb prep sap, or just Lotheb. Lotheb by itself seems like you're so vulnerable to your opponent having a Defender of Argus. Yeah. I mean, Strife cries Defender of Argus. This game almost ends in the spot. Both his opponent's guys die. He still has two giant minions. Maybe it feels like he has to take that risk, though. Uh, it's possible. People are running one Defender, sometimes two. And if they have the one in it, whatever. But if they don't, I mean, then you can somehow grab a board advantage and keep this prep. Uh, uh, well, you know, Twitch chat will always tell you the exact card that you can lose to at any time if you make any play. Uh, I do think that it's frequently very important to recognize that sometimes you do need to make high-risk plays because you otherwise don't necessarily have the opportunity to actually get back into a game where you're behind. Yeah, one time I was told that the best play is not the correct play sometimes. Um, and in this case, you the defender wasn't there, so as much as you sense might argue... <laughs> That's an aphorism that literally means nothing. I don't even understand it. The best play is clearly the correct play. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just... I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> well, uh, I think what he meant to say is, like, the best play on the normal, like, by normal percentages is not often the play that you should be making. Sometimes a, quote, suboptimal play um, ends up being the play that you should go for because it ends up being the way it works in the game to win. Well, if, if you mean that, that sometimes it's important to, to make risky plays because that gives you the best chance of winning, I completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, a way to sum, that's a way to, like, summarize it in the sentence. But. That's a way to use words that mean something to say kind of what you were saying. Wow, Kimmel, you're hating so hard. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Getting the wrath of the, the game designer here. All right, well... <clears throat> Either way, we agree. We agree that we agree. Agree to agree. Yes. He has Blade Flurry this turn. Um, it's it's it comes at a pretty expensive price of his life. And this is attack into an eight eight, eviscerate your guy, and attack my guy down to one health. And this is this is well a board clear, a very costly one for surrender, who is left with not much but. Strife Crow, at least, doesn't have a Mortal Coil to truly punish him. And this 5-1 this Lotheb really makes him think twice about playing one of his other high-value minions into it. You know, he does have Emperor here, but Emperor into a Lotheb that can just trade with it is not particularly exciting. Yeah, it's not exciting, but does it, it might, open up it anything else, less though? Yeah. But it's, it's much less exciting than if, uh, if it would have cost Surrender additional resources to deal with it. But uh, Emperor is, is a really strong card to play against Rogue when they don't have uh, a, a particularly strong board because their, their most common way to deal with large minions is Sap. And Sap isn't a great answer to Emperor because his primary effect happens at the end of your turn. So it's kind of like sapping like a Ragnaros. You know, it doesn't really deal with the, the value that the card is getting. Well, Striker doesn't necessarily agree. He wants to go instead for <clears throat> board presence here. That's fine, considering, like you said, you know, he doesn't want to lose those things for no value whatsoever. Plus, the Emperor Thorson, what did it really achieve in terms of reducing the cost? Not too much. Oh, that backstab was a reasonable pickup. It does let him kill uh, one of Strife Crow's minions. I imagine he'll probably just want to just want to trade here with the four five. Yeah, Sap doesn't really do much. Yeah, Although I mean, it does remove the taunt of the Ancient Watcher. Hmm. Yeah, not super exciting because he'll end up just having to trade his his uh, Lotheb with one of the two threes. So I think he's better off just killing the Zombie Chow, trading in, and then just setting up a weapon for next turn. 
Yeah, not to mention that if you, uh, y you could sap and kill clear the board, but you definitely can't hit the face because then it opens you up to Molten Giants and you just use your sap. So, right. in this scenario, I think it's better to go for more of the board-centric play yep. and just go ahead and, and kill it instead of the tempo play. And Surrender clearly agrees. His hand right now is pretty bad. He is double prepped. Really needs to pick up a sprint here. Uh, to allow him to, to turn these preps into uh, a, a more <clears throat> valuable set of resources. Oh, yeah. And what, what's sort of really, really funny is that he could prep sprint, and if he picks up another sprint, he could prep sprint again and just have like yeah. a full hand, just like that. Uh, until a low fab game prep, crash. Prep sprint and, oh, wait, no, that doesn't work. Okay, so Fan of Knives, eh, it's at least castable and cycle, so that's actually pretty good. Yeah. You know, it, it, it puts him in a position where he uh, is able to kill. Uh, the 2 3, and he can trade into this Lotheb here. I don't think he wants to attack face because he opens himself up to cheap Molten Giants. Yes. He does have double sap, but right now he's he's passing with literally nothing to play next turn. He has sap, sap, which are not powerful cards when you're not actually on the board yourself. That's true. Surrender has one sap, <clears throat> or two saps, excuse me, one for each caster. In this case, uh, Strifeco can just play his Emperor Thoris and reduce the, the cost of each of them, and now these big threats will start be pushing out every single turn. Also important to note, Strifeco does play Farseer. Uh, that card, I really like Farseer sometimes being rotated and just for <clears throat> being able to keep up the board momentum if you want to heal up a Drake, you know, following a, a trade or whatnot. Um, in this scenario, it might be a key to survive his opponent's holding combo cards. And this is, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier, is that sapping Tharsen it, it's okay, but it doesn't really undo the damage that Thorison already did. And if Strife Crow really yeah. wants to, you can just replay Thorison next turn and uh, end up in you know, a spot where he has even more cost-reduced cards. Though well, the that challenge may, is... That, yeah, that may be scary, yeah, true. given the situation. The board state is, is such that he's at 15. He doesn't know that Surrender's hand is as bad as it is. You know, he has to be thinking, okay, what can I die to? You know, is it possible that my opponent has, you know, prep tinker flurry and just kills me from here? Yeah, it's certainly possible. Um, that's that's where the challenge really comes in. Um, but he now can play the molten giant and the antique heal bot and go halfway. Uh, sure, the other molten giant gets stranded, but then now he's safer against an oil play, which would add about. Uh, about nine damage to the board here, so he still should be safe. That sprint was a big draw, though. He picks was, up another. That was. Oh wow! This is actually. This is huge. We we see we actually see double oil. Oh, mm -hmm. to go with with the the shredders that uh, that shredder has in play here, uh, along with you know that that sap taking the molten giant back. Which is, you know, now uncastable because uh, Strife Crow is at 21 health. Yes. Um, now, I wonder if he's going to let this, um, this antique heal bot live at all. Uh, I, and whether he can hit face. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned with leave, letting it live just because, uh, you know, the possibility of getting both your guys shadow flamed. That said... You do end up with two uh, two bodies left over because your minions are piloted shredders. I think the big question mm -hmm. is more whether you attack the face, right? And actually potentially enable those molten giants because if you don't attack face, your opponent can't possibly molten giant plus taunt next turn. And it looks like he does. Uh, no doomsayer. Huh. It was it was not an no out of disaster. That would have been disastrous. Well, this card is almost effectively disastrous for surrender too because now he's not going to have a minion that sticks on board. Uh, he can play the Dark Bomb onto the Pilot Shredder and then Shadow Flame his Ancient Watcher. That leaves him with three mana remaining, and he can play Farseer, or he can, uh, if he feels confident enough, he can even tap. He doesn't like his hand. And my mind, Berserker would have been pretty cool if he was able to combo with stuff, but not in this scenario. I think Shrefko feels like a huge burden to clear, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's definitely a tough spot for you because you are, your opponent did just draw a lot of cards and, y you know, you do have to, to respect the possible burst mm -hmm. damage potential of uh, Tinker Flurry. Yep. Okay, so he can use his cheaper Shadow Flame instead of the more expensive one and then develop the Farseer. And that's okay too because, you know, you don't really necessarily need a really cheap Shadow Flame. You just need to keep the board clear as a priority against Rogue. Mm -hmm. 
And we see, yeah, just the, uh... Yeah, that's fine, too. Farseer Shadow Flame. And then Ancient Watcher. That's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm a little surprised. I guess he does have Owl in his hand, so the Ancient Watcher is potentially yeah. a threat. And there is an Owl, most likely, in the matchup anyways. Outside of, like, the Vanquish. It's Blade Flurry. So... We see Dagger. Balance. I mean, we could see... Tinker Prep Tinker. <laughs> Well, you want to know something really funny? You can actually big game Hunter Thalnos next turn. <laughs> he did tinker. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and well, this is this is where where surrender feels really really bummed that uh, he lost his full board last turn because if he had yeah. a minion in play to start this turn, he uh, he could he very well just kill his opponent. He what? It's plus six for each of those, then seven for the uh, what's twelve plus. Yeah, he'd actually win the game if he had a two-power minion to play at the start of his turn, I think. Yep. I, oh, he wouldn't be able to double oil flurry, though. Oh, is, is he, he, is he didn't, man, yeah. man off? Because he didn't have enough wep, um, for the weapon, so he ends up crossing oh, right. it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now, this is a little bit awkward for Surrender, because he he, he sets up his, his first oil, but... There's no way that uh, that Thalnos is living through the turn. Yeah. How would you do it? Would you rather silence the, the Thalnos so he doesn't get the card? Or would you silence your watch so you can get the guaranteed board clear and there's no minion that sticks? Um, I'm not really sure. I think, I mean, if you silence the Thalnos, there is still the Thalnos in play. Exactly. So it, it does threaten the, the possibility of a second oil. Um, though I don't think that, that it's actually the point where it's... Uh, danger of being lethal at this point. Well, there is a still no taunts from Striker here. He did play the the one uh, the one Sun Fury earlier, but he is without any way to actually defend himself from minion damage at the moment. Okay. Yeah, we see Owl. Yeah, looks like Owl taking out the the Blood Mage because he doesn't want to uh, risk. Have his opponent actually having a minion to start the turn. So if we do see a deck hand, no, not a deck hand. No, deck hand would have been lethal. You're right. It would have been 19 hand. damage exactly. <laughs> oh man. That would have but, been uh, <laughs> still one of those relatively obscure cards. I mean, I know players like Mister Yagut have actually used it, utilized it a lot. Uh, Firebat also likes the deck hand. Very good against Hunter Tech with freezing traps too. Um, but not in this scenario, he doesn't have it. And instead he's going to have to build the board back up. And he's, How he's, much? In, a, he's in a tough a tough spot to do that is the thing. I mean, he can he can backstab, but because he's already committed an oil here, he, uh, he can't really just easily use his weapon to clear the second minion. Oh, he's going to go oil right away. And then go for the flurry here. Just backstab, backstab. the giant. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. he's all in, but he knows the molten giants uh, are around. He knows that there's a molten giant in his opponent's hand, but he puts his opponent down to five. Pretty significant board. Ooh, yeah. that little foil is actually a pretty big draw. It's able to take out the the four one <laughs> minion for for free. He has uh, Shadow Flame though, so ultimately he's okay. It's yeah. just you know the Mortal Coil allows him to potentially get Taunt, and now he can't yeah. really kill him with like Eviscerate, for example. Right, so. the Mortal Coil actually lets him dig a little bit to to potentially find something to help protect himself. Um, he does also have have Jiraxis. He could theoretically just play uh, Molten Giant, Molten Giant, Jiraxis. Oh, that's great too. I, I actually, really like that one. Fifteen. Yeah, the Mortal Coil allows him to kill that. And then just Molten Giant, Molten Giant, Jaraxxus, putting himself up to 15, and pr presenting lethal next turn. Yeah, it's a fantastic play. And he knows he knows both oils are gone, so these one ones don't really represent. You know, the onboard minions don't really represent a particularly big threat now. So you can just go face. And as your Drake picks up Sprint, yeah, oh, yeah, but sprint. he's gonna have one mana left over. I don't think there's really anything in fine here. Almost out of cards. <laughs> and he's almost out of cards. And, yeah, so and he's like, nearly fatigued. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's just no way. Yep. I don't even know one. I, it had to be naturalized. That, that was 
Yeah. Well, so. that wraps up game three. Strife goes up 2-1 um, in prime position. Again, that rogue surprised me in terms of its timing, but I think that Surrender was going for some mind games there. Um, and for someone like Strife Crow, who's recently just been leaving it up to, uh, you know, randomizing his deck choices so that way he can't be too, pre too predictable, I think uh, trying to go too deep into the mind games and ends up sabotaging yourself sometimes. Yeah, so now Strife Crow just has his Hunter left to win with, uh, which is going to go up against Surrender's Hunter or Rogue. Uh, as we were saying before, Surrender's Face Hunter probably has an advantage, but uh, what do you think about the, the mid-range Hunter versus Rogue matchup? Um, I feel like mid-range Hunter still has the edge, in fact. I know some people are like, well, you can sap high mains and you can still out-tempo them. Um, with like really good stuff of SI7 agents and flurries, but I still feel like Hunter puts on really good pressure. It's like it forces Rogue to always have the right response at the right time, and uh, Rogue is like more and more becoming a deck that kills itself, especially since all of them have gotten aggressive with double oils. Before in the past, Rogue was a little bit more consistent. They'd play two fans, they'd play even a Shiv back in the day. Um, and back in the days, like a couple months ago, uh, but now it's, <laughs> it's like ancient history in, in Hearthstone. You know, we have museums dedicated to those times. Um, but now that they're playing more aggressive with like you know two shredders, two oils type things, um, their their draws become more inconsistent, and that's mm -hmm. that's what makes them sabotage ultimately in some of these series and games. Well, I think most of them don't play with sabotage, but um, we did see a, a a heal bot come out of Surrender's deck in that uh, that last game, so that could that could end up coming up big against Hunter. But Surrender does choose to play his Hunter deck. Uh, which, as we were saying, probably pretty good because the faster Hunter deck typically has the advantage. Wait, did I say two sabotage? I meant two shredders. <laughs> no, I was, I was, you say they sabotage themselves, so I said I didn't oh, think oh, 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 okay. And I think yeah, you can yeah. actually only sabotage your opponent. It's, uh, it's yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. an opponent sacrifices a minion, so... <laughs> Imagine, imagine that you can choose who to sabotage, including yourself. You're making me explain my puns here, Frodan. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if I made like a stupid <laughs> mistake, and you're just jabbing me. A little bit. Gotcha. Well, this right. this hand is effectively terrible for a uh, hunter. I can't imagine Strife Crow wanting to keep that against aggressive hunter. Um, the best he can draw is like the web spinner early on, right? Yeah, oh, it's no, actually a great a great start for Strife Crow here with the web spinner. Uh, it is definitely the, you know, one of the best things that the mid-range hunter deck can hope for. Uh, that and Haunted Creeper are their best tools to contest the early game of the face hunter deck. Right. And it looks like we're seeing coin. I'm guessing into Mad Scientist. Or are we going to see Juggler? Yeah, Juggler's for like the maximum damage. Um, and then the Scientist is for more defensive. And, and Hunter players are pretty split on it. I know some players who you know, excel at Hunter, they're always talking about maximizing damage every single turn, so they're like, you always play Nuff Juggler, even if they have the chance of Fiery War Axe, or have the chance of, you know, Backstab, you just gotta optimize your damage. And some Hunter players, like, favor, like, no, you have to really play your opponent's deck and play at its own pace, so there's no, like, I feel like no player considers it right or wrong um, mm -hmm. in the overall consensus. Do you have an opinion on that at all? The, the big thing is, is considering, well, what can actually contest this Nuff Juggler? here, knowing that you're, you're up against mid-range hunter, uh, where they don't really tend to have abusive sergeants, so it's more difficult for them to potentially trade in with their one power one drop. Uh, and also, at most, we'll usually have, say, uh, a single copy of, of quick shot, maybe two, you know, maybe two quick shots that can actually contest it. Uh, it leaves you with the ability to both potentially kill your opponent's minion for free by just playing a minion onto the board and shooting it with a knife, as well as just getting more damage in. So, that that definitely puts surrender off to a, a pretty big, uh, pretty big start here. That he is uh, got to be the favorite in this game. Well, we'll see if that ends up panning to be the case. This matchup can be really sweet. Depends on who can seize the board commandingly by the mid game. Oh, yeah. Hmm, I don't even know what's the best in this scenario because uh, all of them can end up being really poor. Depends on how the next turn pans out. Yeah, I mean. If you if you animal companion and you get uh, anything but Misha, it's potentially pretty bad for you. And yep. even Misha is pretty bad against a potential abusive sergeant. Uh, Eagle Horn Bow is okay, but you're still taking damage and also right. weakening your potential future Unleash the Hounds. So the, and then of course Unleash the Hounds didn't even clear the board, so you're right, just giving yeah. up the board anyways. So hoping for a Misha, we got a Leoc. That is not what the song says. No. Leoc, nope. 
<laughs> well, I think he mentioned it a little bit, but this does end up becoming pretty awkward. I guess the best scenario for the trades would end up being that the Leoc absorbs additional damage, but then that would opens it up to quick shot instead. Mm -hmm. So I imagine we'll probably see just a trade in here and then it could be, we could just see a hero power out of Surrender if he wants to try and play around uh, Unleash because he will be potentially mm -hmm. left with a board that only has one health minions where it's clearly where Unleash is the strongest because it can trade one for one with all of them. Yes, absolutely true. Um, and you also are mana inefficient by doing it. Mm -hmm. But what it does do is it at least forces the Unleash the Hounds out now, so that way you can't. Um, I actually I like this. I, I you know the he goes for the fifty fifty there that allows him to uh, clear with his knife juggler, which only had one health and was thus vulnerable to Unleash. Uh, and now, even if Strifegrow has Unleash, he's only able to kill two of the minions and has ends up having unspent mana on his turn. Uh, so. That's you know not particularly exciting. He can he can clear the abusive and the the leper gnome if he does does choose to unleash now uh, and maybe deal one damage to the the uh, mad scientist. But that's not really particularly valuable. Hmm. I mean, Strifegrow I think has no play other than unleash this turn. I don't think he can realistically try and play a shredder and contest with minions. He just takes so much damage from the board. Yeah, he goes down to thirteen at least. Based off of, oh, maybe even more considering that the Leopard Gnome does residual damage off its death rattle. So he would be effectively with like 11 health. And that's that's just too little considering that the face hunter can continue to push out damage and you don't have access to things like, um, such as your Houndmaster. Okay, this is interesting. He does go with Freezing Trap and the uh, and the Owl. Uh, in, is this a bluff? In, I... I don't, I don't know that it can possibly like uh, surrender has seen Strife Crow play. You know he has he has access to the the the, the vods from previous games, and I don't think Strife Crow had an explosive in his deck. So, yeah, he's just he's just gonna attack. Gets the abusive freezing trap, which means he just gets to send it again in again once more, if he so chooses. Uh, he also had the option to possibly just unleash and get the the dog sent back as well. Oh but, yeah. Mm. I think you invest the same amount of mana, but lose a damage. Yeah. <laughs> but here we're going to see you know, the abusive come down to pump up the mad scientist, go face, and then, yeah, SM orc. Right, and also now you have, you kept Unleash the Hounds for if he has Unleash the Hounds with Knife Juggler, so if he ends up rebounding on the board, you can rebound right back and decisively keep the advantage. Mm -hmm. Might not work out as clean as that, though, because it looks like the Unleash will just be used solely for board control, and there's not going to be many dogs created. But he's still and, behind, behind the race, though, 13 to 27. And this is what, what we're, when we were talking earlier about uh, how important it is to be the faster hunter deck. You know, now, Surrender can just lean on his hero power. He, it, he's going to win the game in very short order just by damaging his opponent. And this bow into just hero power here, I think, is you know, just leaving his opponent in a situation where he's dead to basically anything next turn. If he hero powers, leaves uh, Strife Crow at 8, and then quick shot, kill command, attack you, just kills him. Interesting. He's going to play a trap. I don't really see... I don't really see the upside of playing that rather than shooting. I mean, it does potentially prevent Strife Crow from attacking or you get an extra charge. But now you don't necessarily have lethal next turn if Strife Crow doesn't attack. Yes, and it gives him a turn of development, too. Like, if he had Houndmaster, then... Mm -hmm. um, the bow gets stopped, and so you don't get that guaranteed damage in and potentially uh, kill. But he's got so much damage anyways, and it almost feels I mean, this, irrelevant. This, this game is basically unwinnable for Strife Crow at this point, just because of the amount of damage that uh, that Surrender has in his hand. And, right. and the, that now, you know, Strife Crow has no taunts, the bow is just going to hit him, and then he's just going to take infinite damage from burn spells. No, but it's a, it's a legitimate... You know, criticism fundamentally of like, you know, if those situations arise where he needed to search for those extra points of damage and his opponent came back, uh, would be relevant. In this case, not really that significant. The series is tied 2 2. We're going to go to game number five with Strife Crow. 
having to win with this hunter up against rogue and uh, this is a spot where like we said uh, a little bit earlier that the hunter likely has the edge uh, rogue is a little bit less consistent of a deck and is a class that uses its life total pretty heavily as a resource thanks to attacking minions with weapons so uh, strife crow's deck is a little a uh, little sort of higher end a little mid-range focused which i think can be uh, a lot uh, better for the rogue because the rogue's pretty well suited to actually prevent things like houndmaster from being able to get value because of how much removal it has yeah, I think the rogue ultimately, um, I mean, I, I don't want to like chalk it up to a lot of simple things like, oh, if rogue has coin or if rogue has this card, like it'll be like guaranteed to win it all. It's, it's still going to be really relative to, based on how hunter curves um, mm -hmm. and if rogue has the right removal. So let's go ahead and hop directly into game five and see what these guys have got. Rogue is not on the coin and that's going to be brutal in terms of making sure that they have the right cards and combo well. Yeah, the, the, the coin is definitely huge. The ability to get coin SI is probably the most important thing at dealing with a lot of the uh, early minions that, that Hunter can present as threats. Uh, from the Hunter perspective, uh, I really like specifically Piloted Shredder as one of your best threats in the matchup because uh, you know it, it will take removal from the rogue and then still leave a body over. Uh, and if they don't have removal, it hits pretty hard to begin with. So yep. uh, I feel like... Th that in and things like uh, Haunted Creeper, your sort of stickier minions tend to be the, the real keys to the matchup, in addition to, you know, pressing your button that does two damage. Oh, you're just going to simplify it that easily, huh? <laughs> well, not everyone he, is capable of doing such complicated maneuvers, Kibler, in one turn. <laughs> I mean, you, you really need to embrace the SM work life. That is, uh, that is the key to victory against Rogue. Do you think if like they made it more mechanically harder for Hunter to do the hero power, like you can't target anything else but the hero portrait, but you have to click it, to click the face? If it was like kind of like a Hadouken in Street yeah, Fighter, exactly. you know, you actually had to had to have some mechanical skill to pull it yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, you have to like do you know the quarter circle back on your hero portrait a few times with your mouse movement, and then the it'll unlock the hero power for two seconds, and if you can't, you have to do the motion again. Uh, I mean that that would certainly make the class more difficult to play. I mean, to be fair, I actually do think that uh, that people <laughs> over uh, overstate how easy it is to play, you know, aggressive decks. Uh, I do think that that when you're playing an aggressive deck, a lot of games come down to very thin margins. So while you you may have fewer decisions than a control deck, your decisions in many cases matter more, uh, and you can very easily put yourself in a position to lose by making the wrong decision in those cases. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, aggro decks are very punishing both for opponents who don't have the removal and also for yourself if you make the wrong decision. You're absolutely right. Um, I would act, I mean, that's, that's what Face Hunter is, right? Sometimes you're short by two or three damage or even one damage, and mm -hmm. you realize you didn't sequence properly. You know, you, you might have missed one damage to the juggler, etc. Those things are the, like the most painful type of losses. I mean, or, or identifying when your opponent can actually kill you. You know, in some cases, yes. people, you know, they just send all their damage at face because they're like, whatever, I'm an SM orc, this is what I do. And uh, they end up in a position where uh, they just get, you know, themselves killed when they could have prevented that uh, by using their damage, you know, to do something, to do it to something else other than the, uh, the face. Well... Eagle Horn Bow to control the 3-3s three is one of the keys for the mid-range hunter to stabilize the board early on. Um, so many minions die to the Eagle Horn Bow and the Rogue Arsenal uh, in tandem with even just a little bit of damage as well. Yeah. And this is exactly the, the sort of, you know, attack minions versus attacking phase that I'm talking about. You know, there obviously this is this is a situation where surrenders at 29, so attacking the face there is probably not gonna happen. Um, but being able to evaluate when it is important to actually kill your opponent's minions right. versus go to their face is a really big deal in, in this matchup in particular. I think I'd like to see prep sprint because Pilot Shredder gets challenged by the bow, right? So how much is it realistically going to do anything? Plus, you don't even know if it's going to be a freezing trap that's out there. Oh, never mind. Sorry. A secret <laughs> icon fooled me. I was thwarted. <laughs> never mind. I, I changed my opinion then. Okay. Uh, I, I still think it's worth evaluating the prep sprint there because you it is a resource battle a lot of the times, and prep sprint gets awkward on the next turn. Um, so if your opponent dealt with this, 
even if he had Freezing Trap just naked on the board to answer the, the Pilot Shredder, you would have been in a really awkward spot. So I like generally trying to go for those cards that can really leverage in the mid game, like big things to go with your Blit Flurry that already exists. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of an awkward low feb. Um, if Strikeforce really wants to, he could Hunter's Mark and mm. just get rid of it. Um, though that does potentially leave his board open uh, to removal and doesn't leave much threat of his own in the board. I like the I like the Shredder here a lot better. There's no re no huge incentive to to just clear the low feb right now, and yep. this way you just get to go into the go into the face. SMR. I mean, he gets his own tempo play next turn. Like if his opponent decided to go super aggressive with oils, which Ooh. Is in the hand. That's. And he still has plays with uh, Hunter's Mark and Savannah Jaime next turn because one thing will stick to the board. There's, it's impossible for him to clear everything, I think. Oh, no, he can if he chooses to trade his Lothab in. That, that seems really weak. Yeah, I, I think if, if I'm in Surrender's spot here, I actually like just Dagger Up, Prep, Tinker's Face, Blade Flurry. He has a second Blade Flurry in his hand. So this does this does a ton of damage too. This you know you hit for eight here, four more, four more from Blade Flurry. I guess you could you could attack the Shredder rather than attacking face. So you you make it so that your opponent has to have some sort of resource to be able to actually kill the uh, Lothib on board. But I, I think I like just Blade Flurry hitting face and Blade Flurrying better. You leave your opponent at seven life, and you you would take four damage attacking into the the Shredder anyway. And mm -hmm. you have the, the Blade Flurry in hand to take care of the potential residual from the Shredder. And it's only a two attack minion, so right now, uh, Strife Pro does need to do something to deal with that Lothab. Huh. Strife Pro, thankfully, he has Hunter's Mark, so it's actually pretty easy. Right. If he wants to, he can just play Savannah High Main, Hunter's Mark, and then attack for three with uh, his remaining minions after trading one Spider in. Yeah, I think but. he's evaluating if he can utilize anything else, though. Um, and Hunter's Mark on this makes a lot of sense, but can he start doing enough damage to potentially race the, the rogue? Because you know, this kind of move from the rogue with two cards remaining is like all in, you know, in a sense. So it, I think Strife Crow is trying to evaluate mm -hmm. how many turns will it take to kill his opponent if he plays a high main versus play something else, which I don't think anything else gets better than high main. Uh, what makes it is that Pilot Shredder is better against Sap, so he can hero power. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's about it. I think. I, mean, I think that the Hunter's Mark clear with the Spider is is a play that you 100% have to make. There's, you, you know, you're you're literally useful by that. So. I like playing High Main here because uh, it presents like a you know, obviously presents a big a big resilient threat in the board, and you can also potentially find instances where oh. ooh. Is that okay? No, it's not it, lethal. It's it, one damage off. One damage off lethal. So he can sprint into a lot of possible things that will give him lethal next turn. So yes, he has just worried if he's dead or not. And there's nine damage on board plus two from the hero power, so that's eleven. Uh, two kill commands kills him. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing he can do that that makes him not die here anyway. I guess. I guess he could deadly deadly poison attack. For, oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. It definitely makes sense to just weapon up deadly poison yeah. attack face flurry because you put your opponent into one life. Take take damage off the board. You win with an eviscerate. The only thing that that stops you is Houndmaster, right? Right. And, and you they, might even draw an spell anyway. Houndmaster, and you still still have the possibility of drawing like eviscerate. Or sap to beat it. Yes. So I, I like this. I like this poison attack flurry. You make it extremely unlikely you can possibly die in your opponent's turn, and you make it so that he has literally two outs in his deck to not die, assuming he has two hound masters. Yeah, I like it. And Shrevko needs to draw some taunt. Oh, oh just hound a hound master! Oh, oh my <laughs> god! Shrevko's reaction. He literally. Falls back in his chair as he draws one of the only cards that could possibly win the game. Yeah, and that might be the pace it that he needs to win the game. Surrender has to sprint next turn if he doesn't draw direct damage, and that gives him two turns. And Surrender is devastated. Oh dear. Oh well. Sap. Oh boy. Well, it's not over. It's not over. The game prep oh, sprint, is pretty prep. good. Oh, surrender! You're, you hey, don't hey. don't rope, man. Come on. Oh, I think it's Cam's delayed. I think it's Cam's delayed. Cam's delayed. Okay, well, he's a eviscerate oh. or sap to win the game. No, Fan doesn't. Oh, Drake doesn't. No. 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 Eviscerate. Oh, he got the eviscerate. No. 
Uh, the top deck how that survive, surrender with the top deck sprint into eviscerate to win the game. That was wow, that was an incredible, incredible finish to an awesome series. Yeah. Really dramatic too is the fourth yeah. card. <laughs> Very Yu-Gi-Oh-esque, man. That was that was awesome. Great timing. Uh, great play from Surrender, too. I think a lot of these players from Asia region are very good at Rogue, specifically even the Pacific Islands, like, you know, Taiwan and other people that, like, Singapore. Like, some of these players, I mean, I know Surrender is Korean, but you talk about, you know, not the non-Chinese regions. They're excellent Rogue players, and I was very impressed with that game overall from Surrender. Yeah, I, I definitely liked his play there. I uh, I think that, you know, his decision to, to go face rather than try to play this control game when he knows what's coming up in the future turns. Trying to play a more controlling game when your opponent is about to start dropping high mains is less likely to win than, uh, you know, going face. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And with that, we have only two more series remaining. We have Trump versus Toyota coming up, and then we saw Surrender uh, being able to defeat Strife Crow will end up going against Toyota, I believe. Oh, no, sorry, excuse me. Uh, I, I actually misspoke there. Um, we have Trump coming up here versus the semifinal of that, so we end up having one of the quarterfinals finish. So Surrender will wait the winner of the next match. Yes. My apologies. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much for everybody who's tuning in to watch. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to have more action here at the Vulcan Deckmasters Playoffs Day number two, so stay tuned. We'll be back in just a sec. <laughs> 